David, as we hear God's word for us today, coming from the Apostle Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, we hear Paul's prayer for the Ephesians and for us. This is why I kneel before the Father. Every ethnic group in heaven or on earth is recognized by him. I ask that he will strengthen you in your inner selves from the riches of his glory through the Spirit. I ask that Christ will live in your heart through faith as a result of having strong roots in love. I ask that you will receive the power to grasp love's width and length, height and depth together with all believers. I ask that you will know the love of Christ that is beyond knowledge so that you will be filled entirely with the fullness of God. <clears throat> Glory to God who is able to do far beyond all we ask or imagine by his power at work within us. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus for all generations forever and always. Amen. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. I invite you to join me in prayer. Dear God of love and grace, we gather in this, your holy space. Make us sensitive to your presence among us as you remove from us all wandering thoughts and distractions that we might hear clearly your word to us this day. Speak to our hearts, to our minds, and to our spirits. For unless you speak, nothing of eternal significance will be said here this day. We offer this prayer in the matchless name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Some of you know that when I went to Columbia College, I majored in public affairs, which was a combination of history and political science. And as I thought back over those years of sitting in class after class, learning about history, I thought, how much of that history do I really remember? How many dates and times? I was talking to somebody the other day about my memory, and I said, you know, it's almost like I really crammed for those tests. I mean, I graduated with honors, so I did pretty well. I crammed for those tests, but probably by the next semester, most of it had fluttered out of my brain. And yet, I remember being in the third grade and taking South Carolina history. How many of y'all took South Carolina history in the third grade? And my third grade teacher taught me something. She wanted to make sure that we knew all 46 counties in the state of South Carolina. Do y'all know the 46 counties? Somebody back here in the choir knows it. Abbeville, Aiken, Allendale, Anderson, Bamberg, Barnwell, Buford, Berkeley, Calhoun, Charleston, Cherokee, Chester, Chesterfield, Clarington, and Carlington, Darlington, and Dillon, Dorchester, Sheffield, Pepper, Florence, Georgetown, Greenville, Greenwood, Hampton, Orie, Jasper, Kershaw, Lake for Lawrence, Lee, Lexington, McCormick, and Marion, Marlboro, Newberry, Oconee, Orangeburg, and Pickens, Richland, and Saluda, Spartanburg, Sumter, Union, Williamsburg, Again, York. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I also remember the Big Mac song. I bet many of y'all remember that too from McDonald's, right? About the two all beef patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on the sesame seed bun? Yeah, I saw you. You know it. It's interesting, isn't it? 
how we can forget so many facts, but little songs like that, mnemonic devices, sear them into our brain. I've been talking with a few of you recently about wanting to start a midweek worship service, maybe starting out just once a month, just a short 30-minute service for people who are memory impaired. This 30-minute service would consist mostly of music and mostly of the old-time hymns, the old-time hymns that remind us of how we are rooted and grounded in the love of Christ. Because years ago, when I attended classes to learn about dementia and Alzheimer's disease, I was told that music memory is one of the last memories to leave us, which is why I remember all 46 counties. The music stays with us. In this small group brochure, you'll read about joining the choir or having children and youth participate in a youth and children's choir. And part of what we wrote in there is that the hymns that we sing are many gospel lessons that we can take out into the world with us to remind us Monday through Friday of our faith. And that's important, my friends, because just like I forgot so much of the history that I learned in college, we easily forget the grounding of our faith. We forget what is most important about our life of faith so easily. When we get out there in the hustle and bustle and the stresses and distractions of this world, which is why I prayed this morning that the Spirit might remove from us all wandering thoughts and distractions because we get so easily distracted and pulled away and we forget that we are beloved children of God, strengthened with the power of Jesus Christ to do more than we can imagine. And so when we look at the troubles in the world and we think, oh, well, I can't do anything, it's because we've forgotten that we have the power of Christ at work in us. The scripture lesson that I just read for us today is from the Apostle Paul. And you remember that the Apostle Paul is one who, once he came to know Christ, he went throughout the region planting churches. And once he got a church established, he would move on to a new place and establish a church in a new community. But he would remember those churches that he established and he would hear that they were having difficulty. They knew in their heads what they believed. They believed in Jesus Christ, that he suffered and died and that he rose again. But they had difficulty applying that to their everyday lives. They knew that the greatest commandments were to love God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength and to love their neighbor as themselves. But they had difficulty living that way. When they were in the workplace, in their marriage, in parenting their children, in going to school, they had difficulty remembering how to apply all of that. And so the Apostle Paul writes letters to these churches to try to help them understand how to live out their faith. And when he writes to this church in Ephesus, he's sitting in a prison cell himself and he's towards the end of his life. And he knows that he doesn't have much more time to write letters to help the people in the churches know how to apply their faith to their life, to remember what it is that he has helped them to learn about Jesus and that they have come to know in their relationship with Christ. 
And so as he writes this letter to them, he lifts up what he believes is the most important thing for them to remember. He says, I am praying for you. I am praying for you that you might really, really get in the deep down depths of who you are how much Jesus loves you. It's not just a simple little cutesy song, Jesus loves me, this I know. It's something for us to name and to claim and to live out of every single day of our lives. Now think about that for a minute. If you really, really, truly believed that you were totally loved, no matter how much you mess up, no matter what you don't like about your appearance, no matter what you don't like about your life, that Jesus loves you anyway, what difference would it make in the decisions that you make, in the actions that you take, in the way you approach life? What kind of confidence would it give you? What kind of courage would it give you to do things that you've always wanted to do or to say things that you feel like you need to say but you're afraid to say them? The Apostle Paul could have prayed for anything for these people. He could have prayed for their health. He could have prayed for their safety. He could have prayed for their strength. But he doesn't. He prays for them to really know how loved they are. My friends, that's my deepest desire for you too. I believe that's the deepest desire of every pastor who has ever stood in this pulpit. If you come here and you walk out the doors and you have all sorts of knowledge of the parables and of the Old Testament, and if you could sing the song that tells you all the books of the Bible, but you walk out of here and you feel unworthy or unloved somehow, we haven't done our job. The most important thing about the church is to proclaim the love of Jesus Christ and the length to which Jesus went to show us how much we are loved and cared for. When you leave this sanctuary Sunday after Sunday, I hope that you have a feeling in your heart that you've been warmed by the love of Christ and that that love will be deeply rooted and grounded in you. It's part of the reason we're starting these small groups. We want to make sure that everybody here is somehow more deeply connected to Jesus and more deeply connected to one another. So you'll see in the brochure that we're going to have a walking, running, hiking group. And you may think, oh, that's to get my body healthy. Well, it is. But part of what's going to happen as we walk or run or hike together is we're going to share life with each other, get to know each other, share each other's stories, and share with each other where Christ is at work in our lives. And pray for each other. Pray with each other have our eyes opened to see the beauty of Christ's work in this world. You'll see in the brochure that we'll have a drama group. And you may think, oh, that's fun, that's fun. Well, it is fun. And it's meant to be fun. For Jesus came that we might have abundant life. But part of what's going to happen in that drama group is we're going to get deeply involved in the stories of Scripture. We're going to understand who we are and who God is as we live out this living drama of the Holy Scriptures and of life lived in community with one another. Everything that the church does should point to that love of Jesus Christ to help us be rooted and grounded in the love of Christ. 
And that's really why we celebrate this sacrament of Holy Communion on the first Sunday of every month. We gather together around this table and we share little cups or we dip our bread in a chalice filled with grape juice. And we say, the body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. Some people really don't understand why we do that. Maybe if you're brand new to the church, it's kind of odd to you too, and you hear us talking about body and blood, and you're like, what? What's this all about? This ancient thing that the church has been doing, why do we keep on doing it? No matter what the style of worship is, whether it's a very contemporary church or whether it's a very high liturgical church, this meal is shared. Because this meal really is about that love. This meal is a reminder that we are to be rooted and grounded in the love of Jesus Christ. And it's a reminder of how we can be rooted and grounded in that love. The Apostle Paul, when he wrote to the church in Corinth, he wrote for the very first time a quote from Jesus himself. The Apostle Paul's letters written down before the Gospels. And the Apostle Paul wrote that as Jesus shared this meal, it was a meal that he and his disciples had been eating together the whole time they'd been together. Each one of them had been eating this meal the whole time they'd been alive. It was an annual meal known as the Passover. They gathered together to eat this traditional celebratory meal that Jews had been eating for years to celebrate their liberation from bondage in Egypt, to remember that God was with them and heard their cries and brought them out of slavery into freedom. It was a regular celebratory meal together. But Jesus knew it was his last time celebrating that meal with him. And so he did something different. He took that bread, and after he gave thanks, he broke the bread and passed it out to the disciples, and he said, This is my body, my flesh, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now the implication there, my friends, is that they would forget. So he said, do this in remembrance of me. Remember me when you break this bread. And then he took the cup and he said, as you drink this, Remember that this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And if you go back and you read your Greek New Testament, you'll understand that part of what Jesus said when he said in, the Greek word en, and he's telling them, to remember the sacrifice, to remember what it cost me, to remember how deep and wide my love is for you, that I'm willing to give my life. I love you so, so much. I'm willing to suffer whatever it takes because I love you. Far from being just simple bread and simple juice, this meal is to be a reminder to us of how deep Jesus loves each one of us. And don't miss the symbolism here, my friends, the metaphor that is there. Take and eat. 
This is my body given for you. I will be living in you. Drink. This is my blood shed for you. I will be living in you, through you. There is no place that you can go in this world that Christ does not go with you. Christ goes before you, Christ goes beside you, Christ goes behind you, Christ goes with you, Christ is in you, working God's power and strength in this world. That's how much Jesus loves you. To indwell you and to equip you and empower you to do the work of God's kingdom here and now. You are able to do immeasurably more than you can think or imagine, my friends, because the power of Jesus is with you. He loves you so much, he's going with you everywhere.